Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of CCC Talks with Mark O'Loughlin and the Cloud Credential Council. Very excited today. Today, we are joined by Piero Scaruffi. Uh, Piero, uh, for a number of years, was a founding director of the Artificial Intelligence Center based out in California, uh, later moving to IntelliCorp, one of the earliest companies specializing in artificial intelligence. Piero has been a visiting scholar at both Harvard and Stanford, conducting research into AI and cognitive science. And if that's not enough, you've written a lot of books, a very prolific author, and recent books include Thinking About Thought, which is in four volumes, uh, looking at cognitive science, and Intelligence is Not Artificial. There's a book on artificial intelligence, the singularity, and the post-human condition. Now, Piero, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, today. Thank you. Thank you. Tell us just a little bit about yourself and what you do. Uh, what, what's happening recently? Um, I, these days I call myself a cultural historian because um, after many years in the in the software industry and with uh, with a strong interest in uh, in the arts and in, uh, in culture I, I got really more interested in studying the history of our species, uh, but from a cultural point of view. And, uh, I mean, the history mm -hmm. books tend to focus on wars and uh, and generals yes. and kings, and uh, and they they neglect a little bit um, the cultural world uh, that, in my opinion, was very important in shaping uh, the history of our species and, and just people, just uh, how people behave. So these days I'm more of a cultural historian. My background, I, mean, I studied mathematics in, uh, in Italy, then I moved to the US, uh, started this uh, artificial intelligence center, and yeah. I was pretty much uh, you know, in the world of Silicon Valley for these last uh, 27 years. Fantastic, so a lot of experience there, a lot of background. Um, I think uh, some very interesting areas to, to explore. Um, now, to get started, let me ask you, I guess, a really simple question, simple as can be, what is artificial intelligence? What, what is AI? Yeah, that's, uh, that's actually a very difficult question. Um, <laughs> as, you, as, you, as you well know, AI has been around a long time. And yes. uh, when I entered AI, which was in the early 80s, uh, it was relatively easy to define <clears throat> because there were two schools. Uh, one was uh, rule-based programming and the other one was uh, neural network uh, programming. And, and those are different ways of, of programming a computer. So it was relatively yeah. easy to say, <clears throat> this is what AI is. That's different from programming in, uh, well, today we will say in C, uh, Java and so on. In those days, it was you know, other languages. Yes. Uh, yes. But it was a different way of program. Now, fast forward to 2020, and uh, there's been a lot of progress. There's been a, certainly a, a lot of new, uh, a lot of improvements in, uh, in the old concept. One school uh, so far has won over the other, but people started calling artificial intelligence a lot of things that I think back then we wouldn't have called AI. And uh, the more popular it becomes, uh, the more things I see called AI. So it has, <laughs> so it has become a really um, a general. And on, on top of that, you also have a Hollywood movies. Uh, Hollywood movies further complicate uh, things. I mean, if you go back to Turing's uh, misunderstood and misquoted uh, paper, um, then uh, you have a behaviorist. Uh, definition of AI, a machine that uh, behaves just uh, like a human being. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but that's very vague uh, because, you know, you can uh, you can have uh, simulations of human beings that then you wouldn't consider uh, human beings. You know, it's not it's not difficult to 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 uh, create uh, a, an artificial object that uh, that is a remote controlled and behaves like a human being and we wouldn't consider yeah. it AI. So definition is not very easy these days, um, which is good for people in the business because you can call everything AI. Right? You see, I have, a, I have a friend, I don't want to, to name names because I have a friend who has been doing things uh, with statistics for a long time and she just changed all the brochures of her startup and instead of statistics, now they, they say machine learning and it sounds more... more <laughs> 
There is an element of that, I think. And I think when you're talking about the AI and other things that could be called machine learning, whatever that is, um, you've got to try and understand some of the basics, uh, some of the basics of what this what this is. Um, to be able to see is what's being presented today something that existed in another form previously, with just the labels changed. Um, so other thing, you, you were mentioning there that AI can be called other things. One of them, machine learning. Are there any other phrases or names that you've come across recently that get confused with AI? No, I think I think now that the, the word AI is becoming uh, prevalent. But again, you know, sometimes it means nothing. So I prefer, I mean, when you talk with people here who are really doing uh, AI, then then they will be more specific. I'm working on GANs. I'm working on uh, the, the the transformer uh, method. So it's it's more specific. Then then you really know what they're talking about. When when a startup tells me I have an AI product, uh, I, I have no idea what's behind it. It could be old-fashioned linear regression. Uh, it could be you know just. <laughs> yeah. okay. You so have one, to go... thing, one thing that you may have noticed in my in my talks, I, I tend to uh, <clears throat> uh, not so much demystify, but just tell the truth of what is going on. That <clears throat> I call the the Hollywood AI and and the Chinese AI. Those are the two extremes, and I don't want to offend the Hollywood. I don't want to offend the Chinese. Yes, Those yes. Are the two extremes. Now, Chinese AI, which is really also here, is when you call just about anything ai anything that is automation uh you call it ai and uh, yeah. sometimes it is ai sometimes it's not it's just very popular uh why do i do i pick on the chinese because the chinese missed the first uh, uh 60 years of, of the history of ai so that yes. sometimes when yeah. i tell them yeah. the story they they look at me like oh really we thought ai was just invented five years ago so it is not so clear to them that AI should be uh, qualitatively, it should be inherently different from the way you program uh, computers traditionally. And yes. they don't have the cost of the, of the traditional, you know, they don't have computers on the mouth. That's what, that's uh, so, what so that's, and that's an approach that is widespread now everywhere, you know, where you write a piece of software, you call it AI. Uh, why? Because, you know, it, automates something that humans do um <clears throat> the hollywood ai is uh, the ai that doesn't exist that will not exist anytime soon you know the, the ex machina kind of ai yes uh, where, where the machine does amazing things and so on now the, the the ai that i know i think most of my friends know uh is is way humbler than than the, the, the hollywood ai and it, it is uh way smarter than most of the AI and it consists in really tweaking algorithm uh, uh, day and night until until they work and doing a lot of math and uh, sometimes the result is machine that can uh, that can listen to me speaking now and and, uh, and pick out the words fantastic I think straight into it there the difference between Chinese AI if I understood is they think it's only been invented the last five, ten years or so because they don't have that history. America or Hollywood AI uh, being it doesn't doesn't exist at the moment. So somewhere in the middle is is what we're talking about there, as you were saying a few examples. Um, I have heard you mention those phrases and talk about that. And I'd encourage any listeners listening in to go and have a look at some of those sessions. They're really, really good that, that you've given on that. And I think to me that is a really good way of positioning some of the AI that's out there at the moment with those types of, of, of names. Um, Piero, I've also watched you talk about the alternative and widely biased history of AI. And in that you talk about, you know, it's almost like getting in a time machine, going back to 1951 as being an important milestone in the history of AI. And I think you relate that to the birth of modern computing, I think. Is that the overlap uh, in relation to 1951? Is that where AI started along with computing? Wow. Yeah, so AI was called AI in 1955, <clears throat> but before that, I mean, that's that's the year when uh, uh, I think it was John McCarthy came up with the thing. Uh, before that, I mean, 19, uh, maybe even 1950, uh, there were already conferences on machine translation, mm -hmm. automatic machine translation. Um, 1951, 
I mentioned 1951 because uh, now I'm in Silicon Valley and over here everything is uh, US centric. Uh, in 1951, there was a conference on uh, thinking machines uh, in Paris. And that's never mentioned in the United States. Why? Because it was in Europe, you know? So every now and then, <laughs> every now and then, I wear the head of the Euro nationalist. Uh, but there were conferences before the famous one in 1955. So it really mm -hmm. depends on where you want to start. Uh, some people start with the Turing machine. When was it? 36? Yeah. And some people yeah. start with the girdle. So, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, girdle invented much of what will be used later. Uh, so, you know, it's it's been a progress that started uh, way back. You can go back to Leibniz, you can go back to, you know, a lot of people have had this idea of having machines that can uh, automatically, uh, you know, do yeah. some kind yeah. of reason. But so I really, think that... 1951 is, is when you have the first commercial computers. And again, yes. in the United States, they think it's the Univac, and I, I, I credit... Uh, uh, England has introduced the first, but just a few months earlier, England introduced the first commercial computer, the first, you know, computer you could buy, put it this way, yes. although only, only two or three copies were sold, but, <laughs> and, and so that's, that's to me, you know, a, a reasonable date to start thinking about, uh, uh, about artificial intelligence, but the name came in 1955. Good. And I think it gives people good grounding to think that AI isn't something that just appeared in the last five or 10 years or that's built on all this cloud and digital infrastructure that we now have. It's existed a long time before then. And if you're really serious about doing something with AI today, maybe I always look back in history, maybe go back over the course of history and see what it's really about. What were the big, you know, improvements in AI back at a time when technology was still advancing as well? Uh, and it might be good for listeners to to go on that journey, have a look at what people were doing beforehand to really understand what AI really is. Piero, I've seen you talk about the author um, C. P. Snow and a book, The Two Cultures, and how this relates to the age of AI. Can you share some insights regarding? CP Snow, the two cultures and its relationship with AI. Yeah, so CP Snow was a very interesting character. He was a scientist at the same time he wrote novels. And uh, one day he gave a lecture that later became the book uh, talking about the two cultures. And uh, he, um, I don't know if he lamented, but he pointed out that we were building this, uh, uh, <clears throat> this gap. It was getting bigger between uh, science and humanities. Yes. And I feel that that's very, very, um, uh, very, very true today. And today I see it as a problem. Um, um, so the first thing you notice, uh, very, very, uh, very obvious in uh, universities like Stanford, where I spend a lot of my time, is is the is the gap between science and arts. That's uh, uh, to most artists, uh, science is a, is a mystery. Sometimes it's just mumbo jumbo, and that lot of scientist art is uh, is uh, at best uh, a Sunday hobby. Yes, uh, which obviously wasn't true if you go back to the Italian Renaissance or to Athens or to whatever. Um, and and in general, the fact that the humanities are not um, are not integrated with with the science, I think it has uh, negative effects of, of different kinds. So. First, I, I could give you a long history, a long story of why Silicon Valley became Silicon Valley. And uh, that's, that's very, Silicon Valley is very misunderstood outside Silicon Valley. Uh, people think that uh, uh, in, uh, in places like China, they think the government invented Silicon Valley. I, I think government had no idea mm -hmm. that Silicon Valley was happening. And someday, a president in Washington was reading the, the newspaper and said, what is this Silicon Valley? You know, it's, it's, it was totally independent of, uh, of uh, government plans. Yes. And in Europe, yes. tend to think it's just a bunch of greedy capitalists that somehow out of nowhere uh, uh, invented this, uh, this area. And the truth is that Silicon Valley happened in the Bay Area, which is a place where humanities, technology, and science have coexisted. It is mm -hmm. precisely the place uh, where you had the crazy uh, poets, the beat poets in San Francisco, you you had the 
the crazy politicians in Berkeley. Some people say Berkeley is the most communist country in the world. And uh, and then and then you had technology that came by accident, came with yes. World War II, yes. and especially with the Cold War. And it was precisely the interaction that gave us uh, this uh, this incredible creativity. It gave us the garage startup, uh, which is not the typical European corporation. Yeah. Uh, and it gave us all these people who think different, go to work in t-shirts and shorts, and uh, and uh, sometimes do drugs, do do all sort yep. of. Uh, no. So, so that that was so. That I think that when you separate, when you split, when you uh, humanities and science, uh, that you lose uh, you lose something that to me is important. AI is also a good example. I mean, today everybody talks about deep learning, uh, which is the modern, the most successful branch of modern AI. And the deep learning yeah. has given us uh, Siri, has given us uh, face recognition and so on. So it has been successful. But I gave a talk where I said, deep learning is not deep thinking. What yes. humans do yeah. is not just to recognize that a cat is a cat. That's relatively easy, by the way, for us humans. <clears throat> Something we do without having to see millions of cats. Machines need to be shown millions of cats before for the understand what is a cat. But when we see a cat, there's a whole story behind cats. We know what cats do. Uh, and uh, we can relate to, to, to Schrodinger's cat in physics. You know, this, and that's deep thinking and machines don't do that. And so if you don't have this connection with the humanities, sometimes you miss the point of what it means being human and the things that humans really do. I mean, we, we don't play chess as well as a machine, uh, but we can go shopping, uh, we can have a political conversation, and the machine that plays chess very well cannot do any of these things. So, yes. you know, yes. so, so that's, that's my interest in a CP Snow's uh, thing, that it's, it's now 60, maybe 70 years uh, yeah. uh, old, but I think it's, it's very current. And so many of the things that I do here in Silicon Valley at Stanford in particular, are trying to bridge uh, humanities and sciences. That's, that's an amazing view, and I, I encourage people to have a think about that, the bridge between the humanities and sciences, the tale of two cultures. Uh, and then you go on about talking about the difference between deep learning and deep thinking. I've heard a lot of people talk about deep learning less people talking about the deep thinking part. And I think that would be as important, if not more important as well. You need to have both as that balance. I think that's that's, uh, that's very interesting. It might help people as well to try and understand a bit more about what their AI is. Is it doing more of the learning or thinking or, or how it's going on? Um, is today's, Piero, is today's AI just better automation through better software and based on cloud and digital technologies, or is there more to it than that? No, I think I think there is more. I mean, ultimately, that's what it is. And, and in many cases, that's all it is. But yes. if we talk about the people who are really doing AI in the lab, as I said, they spend day and night tweaking algorithms. Well, those yeah. algorithms have something different. And yes. uh, the foundations are from the 50s, neural networks. Uh, now I can remember, I mean, when the perceptron was first uh, demonstrated was in the second half of the 50s. Before that, uh, people like Minsky and others had implemented the hardware uh, neural networks. Uh, so the concept goes back a long time. Uh, but today we have algorithms that uh, allow people to create neural networks with uh, hundreds of layers and that was not available before. So yes. from, from the point of view of computational math, there is something new. Uh, from a conceptual point of view, um, maybe it's not so new, but if you are a computational mathematician, you appreciate that uh, there has been uh, some uh, significant improvements that go back, yes. you know, I, I, I usually, say that 2006, 2007 is when this algorithm uh, came out um, and changed the, the, the change just the, what you can achieve with, uh, with these concepts. So the concepts was there before, but without this, without the, the mathematical engine 
uh, you wouldn't have the results you have today. To do that, and if you're in and around 2006, coincides roughly with the birth of what we now call cloud cloud computing. It was starting to come out at that time as well. So there's probably a bit of an overlay with all that shared resource ability, perhaps that, or at least that makes it more accessible to the average organization and the average person to see AI and use AI in action. Yeah, I think I think so. 2006, 2007 is when the papers were published, but when the first results came out, that made people uh, pay attention was 2012. And the reason is that you need that, first of all, much more powerful processors. Yes. And yes. Uh, yes. luckily, luckily we had uh, video games and <laughs> these this more powerful processors were invented for the graphics or, the, or video games. Yes. And we have to thank that. And then you need the data sets because uh, this deep learning relies heavily on having a data set mm -hmm. uh, that you can use to train the machine. And uh, so data sets were developed uh, about that time. So it was a convergence of several factors, uh, which doesn't detract from the uh, merits of the people who invented the algorithm. But yes, without the infrastructure, uh, it would not have happened. Yes, we see um, encourage people to think from the CCC perspective. We have a broad portfolio that the, if they're considering AI, that they still have to understand, say, cloud to get the mass compute resources, but also the likes of big data to be able to go hold data, analyze data, store data, and, and um, things like that. So there is a huge overlap. Piero, can I ask um, what's coming down the line in AI in? The most in the next couple of years why should we be getting excited today about ai what's what's coming down the tracks yeah. so first of all i'm personally not uh, terribly excited i'm uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm i'm pleased i'm pleased that, that uh, finally we see uh, some results um i mean in, in terms of uh, uh results again machines are doing deep learning not deep thinking so it's important to to, to be realistic about the, what they can achieve. You know, that's, yes. think, think of the current uh, pandemic. We're talking in the middle of the pandemic that has killed what? I uh, don't remember. United States alone, 120,000 people. Yes. Worldwide, I don't know, half a million. Yeah. Uh, what has, I mean, these, these super intelligent machines, what have they done for us? You know, it's a, I always joke here in Silicon Valley, there were all these meetup groups talking about the singularities coming very soon. Uh, according to some people, it was supposed to come this year, 2020. And uh, it's, we have all these talks about the, the machines being so intelligent, and, and, and then a virus comes. And guess what? We don't have toilet paper in Silicon Valley. <laughs> so, it, you know, it... it, it uh, yeah, yes. So, Oh, that's so. That's why I don't get too excited. There's that. There's ob very obvious, and these machines have helped us almost zero in the pandemic. I mean, what has AI done to help us uh, prevent zero, but uh, even even fight the virus? Very little, very little. There's actually one contribution came from Taiwan, uh, where they discovered some uh, antibodies using AI, but still very little, very little. Who 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 is fighting the virus? Virologists, human beings, yeah. you know, human beings working day and night um, to to find out what's what this virus is and does. When will AI do this job? Oh my God! I I I, 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 I mean, I will not be alive. You know, it's it's so far unless somebody has an amazing breakthrough in the next few years. And so so it you know it's it's important to um to to see things in perspective what ai yeah. can do um is is useful i mean it can uh, you know sometimes uh, i'm driving I, I cannot stop and look at the phone but i can talk to the phone and uh and uh, face recognition has pros and cons but certainly machines can recognize more and more what goes on in the in a in a scene so yes yeah. some things are useful but i you know i wouldn't say i get excited the same way i get excited when I listen to some uh, new music or see some new paintings, uh, there's still it's still a very um, what is interesting uh, is um, again the computational math. 
I mean, people keep improving those algorithms. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's very interesting that, that machines can achieve uh, such high resolution in generating images now. Um, so, but those are really things that you appreciate as a computational mathematician. Yes. Um, yes. So you know, there's some good things, some bad things. Now, coming to the business, that's also something to put in perspective. The the amount of money you make with AI is very little, I mean, compared to the the pot of uh, IT. Uh, we're still talking. I, there's no equivalent of uh, Walmart in the, in the AI world. This uh, yeah. it's, it's still uh, why because a lot of these things are free. You know, the Google search engine, which is the number one application of AI in the world, is free. And um, DeepMind makes great uh, uh, software to play games, but uh, you know what's uh, what's the revenues? So I would put yeah. things in perspective, and I would say. Intellectually, it's always interesting to discuss it. Um, in practice, um, in practice, it's useful, but you know, let's not get too excited about it. Okay, I think some really good points there. Um, we'll probably see more and more case studies on AI, how it helped deal with the pandemic going forward. Um, but again, uh, for listeners, just to understand, is it true AI or is it a marketing spin being put on it? But that, that's for another day. Um, what challenges do you see in organizations? So an organization wants to adopt AI, they they want to explore doing something with it. But what challenges, one or two challenges, do you see facing organizations immediately? We mentioned one of them at the start of this was, I think one of the biggest challenges is trying to answer the question, what is AI? But are there any other challenges that you think organizations would face if they want to let's say, do something with AI? Yeah, so so I've been asked this question, in particular, um, when, when I was spending a lot of time in China, and, uh, and so because in China, as you probably know, at one point it became a government, a mandated national goal uh, to invest in AI. And so everybody was uh, frantically trying to figure out uh, how do I use AI in my business? Yes, and yes. That, so the so the way to approach it, of course, uh, is, is is the other way around. I mean, what what you what is it that you cannot do today and you would like to do? And then we can discuss how we do it. And uh, when you tell me what you cannot do today that you would like to do, um, then the next question I have is, uh, do you have a data set to train the machine to do it? Yes, yes. So there's some fundamental things that you need to have because today's AI again. Is uh, is deep learning? It's mostly deep learning, yes. and deep learning doesn't work without a data set. Yes. So it's, you know, again, you have uh, when you when you think of applying to an organization, you have uh, to think about uh, practical uh, issues. And um, I have to say, I would say that of all the stories I I heard in China and the United States about uh, using deep learning in, in uh, organizations, about fifty percent. Uh, worked, and the other fifty percent were just a large uh, consulting organizations trying to sell a new popular buzzword, try to sell it at, at a very high price. Yes, yes. So that's so, interesting. Uh, Those kind of success rates, fifty percent. Again, if you're investing a lot of money, uh, you know, it's it's you've got to go in. I think eyes wide open. You've given us some really good things to think about before going on that investment in time, money, and and resources. Um, we see a lot of AI moving into the automation space uh, and driving, let's say, let's put a label, white collar automation. Um, like what's happened in the manufacturing industry over the, the decades and so forth, where we've automated jobs with machines. Are we now, should the white collar workers be worried that AI is coming to automate their jobs? And A, should they be worried? And B, you know, or is it changing? Uh, the world of work to some extent i mean there's there's a deep learning that is used uh, as better statistics now statistics did not replace people I mean, actually statistics sometimes replace people uh, <laughs> yeah. but you know not not in a massive uh large scale uh, so uh, some of AI is just the, the modern way to do statistics, and uh, hopefully it, is, it gives better results. 
yeah. uh, the, the jobs they can be replaced, whether they are blue, white, red, yellow, yeah. Yeah. they are the jobs, the jobs that are repetitive. So I keep I keep telling people that it's not about the color of the shirt that you wear at work. Yeah. It's about how repetitive is your work? How is it how easy is it to be cloned by a machine? And yes. what has happened over the last 20, 30, 40 years for a number of reasons is that we have come up with rules that people have to follow in an office. Uh, and then when you are following a repetitive pattern because they told you that's what you have to do, well, then the, the question is only, is it cheaper? Is your salary cheaper or is it the machine cheaper? And then you pick the one that because that can be uh, done by a machine. So it really yes. depends on the job that you're doing. So I disagree in general, the white collar jobs can be uh, yeah. done by machines. Most of them cannot. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I, so I think that the, the key th message there is look at how repetitive that task or activity is and can it be replaced by a machine or by the AI and potentially it's open for that. So identify it if you're in one of these roles, uh, figure it out. Um, and figure out what you need to do to grow beyond maybe that role or that task because automation will happen. It's happened in manufacturing significantly. And it's, you know, so it's encroaching now into, again, whatever it's a white collar, whatever type of collar it is, uh, whatever type of job, as you said, it doesn't matter. Whatever type of job it's looking like automation is now, we're, we're looking to use the software automation and AI to deal with some repetitive roles that we see. So educate yourself and try and move into the next higher value role or something like that, or it will probably create different jobs. Um, Piero, Piero, can I ask you, are there any ethical implications of using AI or any risks to society uh, in the use of AI? That's, that's the question you have to ask about any technology. Yeah. There are always uh, big uh, ethical questions. Um, it's 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 interesting that, uh, of course, I had no idea about this virus. Uh, but years ago, I was talking about one effect of automation is that it creates what we now call social distancing. <laughs> you are increasingly surrounded by machines. Yes. In my presentation, I like to show the picture of this subway in China. It was early morning, but still, this was China. You think China is crowded. And I was in the subway and I took pictures. I was surrounded by machines. You know, a mm. machine sells yeah. tickets. Then there's a machine selling food. There's a machine selling drinks. There was a machine selling toys. Then I don't remember. And then to enter the subway, what I have to do is give the ticket to a machine. Machine yes. gives yeah. me back. I go downstairs. A machine comes, which is a robot. The, the modern subway trains are robots. You know, there's a human being there just in case something happens. Yes. yes. So, so, so I was surrounded, completely surrounded by machines. And uh, not only that, when you board the train, uh, what do you see? You see thousands of people. Are they talking? No, they are like this. Yeah. They have a smartphone, yes. right? So I was talking about the fact, the effect of. Uh, Technologies to create the social distancing, which you know, I wasn't calling social distancing. Then it's it's sort of ironic that a virus comes and forces us. <laughs> yes. But anyway, so so what? Why I bring up that example? Because that's not what you, you usually think of as ethical, uh, but actually it has a huge impact on uh, yeah. on our daily yeah. lives. And uh, so. Besides the issues with privacy and with the, non, the surveillance society and so on, technology always has a huge impact on our lives. And uh, it's always debatable what is good and what is bad. And of course, older people tend to have memory lane. So older people tend to see the negative sides and younger people tend to see the positive side. So there's, there's, uh, there's uh, long discussions to be had about uh, yeah. technology some of them are just uh, you know revising recycling yeah. uh, old ideas come from McLuhan uh, many other great thinkers of the past um, so the question is always so who should be in control of these ethical issues and that's always yes. a delicate mm -hmm. thing I mean you want the government to decide was the ethical in using the technology for the government Yes. If the government, who? The corporations? Corporations are there to make money. Yes, um, yes. It's, it's a tough question. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a it's a tough question. Um, I think many organisations will struggle to get the answer to it, but they should look and understand their tolerance for ethical challenges and how they relate or how they might deal with those um, to kind of de-risk any exposure or to take on some risk. It, but I think that'll be at the moment on an organisational level, um, and it can be different from different organisations. But ultimately who's defining what these ethical things are, as you said, that even that's difficult itself. Um, Piero, I guess, critical question and our final word in this session will be, do you think, can AI make the world a better place? Oh, yes. I, uh, that's why I got into AI at the beginning. Uh, one of the, of the early applications of AI was in the medical field. Yes. And I, I, I remember in those days I was thinking, why only rich people can can access uh, the best doctors? Why why can't we have machines that can that are as good as those doctors, and anybody in the world can use? And that never happened, unfortunately. It turned out that cloning a doctor is one of those very very difficult things that requires <laughs> thinking. You know, it turns out <laughs> it turns out that doctors use science, but the way they they are, their way of reasoning is not a logical reasoning. It's uh, yes, much yes. more complicated. A lot of built-up experience. Cases, yeah. Right, and it's plausible reasoning, and it, it, it has to take into account so many... Uh, so, so anyway, so it never really happened. But that is uh, what we, we, we hope to achieve. It's the, the, the whole idea of automation is sometimes misunderstood. Automation is not just for big corporations to make more money. It's also for ordinary people to have access to tasks that traditionally are very expensive. Yes. And uh, yes. suddenly, you know, some of these, I mean, the smartphone is a good example. You know, so the smartphones in, uh, in India for less than $100 and uh, yes. hundreds of millions of, of uh, people have a smartphone. Uh, which you know, 20 years ago was unthinkable. I mean, you you go on the internet if you work for. When I got on the internet for the first time, it wasn't even called the internet. Yeah. Uh, only big universities, big corporations, and governments. Yes. That was it. I mean, I think even Microsoft wasn't. Uh, well, Microsoft didn't exist. Uh, even some big corporations were not on, uh, on the internet. But today, yeah. everybody, and you can find all sorts of information. You know, it's. Uh, there was a point in life, if you think of it, how many people knew or could find out what is the capital of Kazakhstan? Yeah. You know, only if you had money to buy the Britannica. And I mean, I remember as a child that getting the gift of the encyclopedia was a major uh, gift. It, well, it was a big thing. Yeah. And today I think today, uh, you know, that, that quote that today's ch children are the first generation that will never be lost in general terms because they carry a map with them in basically their phone um that's just in, in general terms so i think that's interesting there the other thing just to finish on the doctor analogy that you were talking about the other big thing i think that even if the technology did allow medical professionals to be clones um there's probably that trust element you know would i trust the ai doctor over a human doctor and I think that would be another barrier or challenge that organizations might face with whatever way they implement um, AI solutions is always that trust factor based on will the customer, will the end user have trust in that and how they try and build and foster that. Sometimes it's a generational thing. Sometimes it's a sales thing. Sometimes it's somewhere in the middle like that. So I think interesting yeah, times ahead. Uh, that's that's another fascinating topic uh, that we've <laughs> seen in many in many areas, I can prove you mathematically that the machine will make fewer mistakes than a human being, uh, yes. but you may, may still trust the human being better, and you cannot explain it rationally. You know. Yes. And, uh, and one favorite example is that is the when we go hiking in the forest, and sometimes we think there's a bear, and there is no bear. Now the machine might not make that mistake. But I think you would trust me better than the machine precisely because I made that mistake. Somehow it tells you <laughs> I know what happens in the forest, right? Yes, yes. Well, it's but but uh, uh, we have to be uh, very uh, happy that AI is beginning to provide very useful information 
Uh, mm -hmm. Years ago, mm -hmm. I was talking about my dream AI. Um, uh, you know, I, I visited Philips, a big company that does imaging, medical imaging, and they told me they have hundreds of millions of medical images that uh, you know doctors took for whatever reason, and they'd be sitting there. One doctor saw it. Wow. And so imagine having an AI that scans all these medical images <clears throat> and finds out if there's something wrong. I mean, yes. that could prevent that could prevent millions of diseases. Guess what? It's happened. So in the last few years, there's been so many systems introduced. They can look at your skin and tell you the probability that that sunspot will develop into a skin cancer. They can look at the, uh, your heart, your brain. You know, all these medical images actually can be processed. So what I want is a cloud where we have all these uh, images. And then we have uh, some uh, bots that non-stop, based on the latest scientific evidence, scan yes. non-stop, non-stop, non-stop. And your image, of course, you lose privacy. But your images are there, and you know there's a new scientific theory that that little dot means something. Bang! You get not notified on your phone. Go talk to your doctor about this thing. That could save your life. So Absolutely. these things are, are happening. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, kind of story to end on there. I think it's really good to think about in terms of that, the, the good for humanity from AI, the health implications, and getting that type of result straight to your phone so you can see the intervention that you do need at the end of the day. Uh, it's a fantastic, um, I guess, viewpoint of that. Um, Piero Scarufi, thank you so much for joining us on today's ccc talks thank you very much it's been very enlightening thank you thank you for the very interesting questions have a good day <laughs> you too